Hi everyone, my name is Gerla Blaine. My name's Charlie. And my name is Aaliyah. We are from UCLA Interaxon, and today we're going to talk about neurosurgery. Let's give a brief overview of what we'll cover in this video. First, we'll define neurosurgery and give you a little background about what neurosurgery is for and how it originated. Then, we'll go over a few different types of brain tumors and the types of cuts made in the central nervous system, often abbreviated to the CNS. Finally, we'll talk about the types of neurosurgery and advancements in the field. Stay tuned for activities along the way. So, what is neurosurgery? Neurosurgery is surgery to repair damage to affected areas of the nervous system. Something interesting to note is that neurosurgery doesn't have to involve the brain. It involves surgeries to fix anything in the central nervous system, including the spinal cord and peripheral nerves. Let's think about why people might need neurosurgery. What can you think of? There are many reasons that people may need to get neurosurgery. Trauma, such as car accidents, can cause damage to many areas of the body, including the brain. Tumors that are in or near the structures of the nervous system can require neurosurgery as well. Strokes cause blockades to blood vessels in the brain, which requires neurosurgery to fix it. Intracerebral hemorrhaging is when bleeding occurs in the brain from a ruptured blood vessel, which may require neurosurgery to relieve pressure. Finally, aneurysm in the brain is the ballooning or expanding of a blood vessel, which can rupture or leak. How long has brain surgery been around? It's actually been around as far back as 3000 BC. Scientists have found prehistoric evidence of surgical techniques such as trepanning, which is used to relieve blood pressure that builds up beneath the dura mater, a thick membrane that surrounds the brain. Most advancements of neurosurgery have actually been pretty recent. Neurosurgery came to a forefront when lobotomies, huge surgical cuts made in the brain's prefrontal cortex, became popular in the 1930s to 1960s as a method of treating mental illness. In present day, new technology such as neuroimaging allows surgeons to pinpoint problems and abnormalities in the brain to massively improve our ability to treat patients. Heard of a tumor? The term tumor refers to a mass that resulted from uncontrolled cell growth. This out of control growth of cells is due to DNA mutations in the cell, which make them replicate way too quickly. As the masses grow larger, they can have serious implications such as blood vessel blockage or interfering with brain function. You may have heard of the terms benign and malignant and the connotations with those terms. A tumor is called benign when it grows slowly and does not spread to other parts of the body. Benign tumors do not require treatment, although a patient may have a benign tumor removed for mobility or cosmetic reasons. A tumor is called malignant when it grows rapidly and does spread to other parts of the body. A malignant tumor is synonymous with cancer and requires treatment such as chemotherapy or surgical removal. Now we will discuss the different types of tumors that can arise. One type of tumor is called meningioma. It occurs in the meninges, which are the three protective layers surrounding our brain and spinal cord. They are called the dura matter, which is shown here in light blue, the arachnoid matter, which are these spider web like pieces in pink, and the pia matter, which is located along here. A meningioma tumor grows so slowly that it can take years to detect. It is usually treated with radiosurgery. Radiosurgery is a type of cancer treatment that targets tumors in small areas of the brain and kills them using dangerous, highly charged radiation waves. Before we discuss the next type of tumor, we first need to be introduced to glia cells. Glia cells, which are also called gliole cells, are the cells in the nervous system that do not send electrical signals. Their main job is to support the nervous system. For example, the oligodendrocytes, which are shown here in blue, 
are in charge of producing myelin, which allows the neurons to send signals. Another type of glia cell we will be discussing are the astrocytes, which are shown here in green. One of their jobs is to be barriers between the blood and the brain. Another type of tumor is called oligodendroglioma. It is made up of oligodendrocytes, which are the glia cells we were just discussing. This type of tumor grows slowly and there is a high rate of survival, which is between 80 to 90%. The rate is high because this tumor is less abrasive than others. In order to diagnose patients correctly, the doctor will first perform a biopsy, which means they will take a sample of body tissue to determine which type of sickness the patient has. If needed, the patient will be treated with radiotherapy. If the patient remains sick, then doctors will use chemotherapy as a last option. An astrocytoma is a tumor made of astrocytes. Astrocytes are glia cells that, as mentioned before, act as a barrier between blood and the brain. They can also help regulate neurons by, for example, providing them nourishment. Astrocytoma is the most common type of glioma, or tumor, that occurs in the brain or spinal cord. It is also the most malignant, meaning it's cancerous. Though astrocytomas can occur in the brain and spinal cord, they are more dangerous in the brain. Spinal decompression is a surgery that relieves pressure on the spinal cord through incisions to the vertebrae, the small bones that make up the backbone, when they put too much pressure on the spinal cord. Pressure on the spinal cord occurs due to bone spurs, which is excessive bone growth, arthritis, or other bone problems. Spinal decompression is usually not life-threatening, though it can cause pain and numbness in the legs. Also, risk for spinal decompression surgery increases with age due to spinal degeneration, which may lead to spinal stenosis, a common condition among the elderly. Now, let's watch a video about spinal decompression. This 3D animation will visually explain the positive effects non-surgical spinal decompression administers to the intervertebral discs of the spine. This view demonstrates healthy discs with normal disc height. Over time, the discs of the spine may deteriorate, bulge or herniate. A disc herniation can occur in any disc of the spine, but the most common form is a lumbar disc herniation. Symptoms of a herniated disc can vary depending on the location of the herniation and the type of soft tissue involved. In many cases, severe and unrelenting pain will radiate into the region served by an affected nerve root that is irritated or impinged by the herniated material. Non-surgical spinal decompression gently pulls the vertebral joints apart. It is believed this precise process produces a negative pressure inside the disc, causing any herniated material to slowly recede away from the affected nerve root and back into the disc. It is also believed through this process the disc is rehydrated, aiding in its restoration. Spinal decompression is a non-invasive treatment and is known to have a very high success rate. Cuts along different planes of the brain allow surgeons to view different angles and views of the brain structures. For example, a coronal cut gives a better view of the lateral ventricles, while a sagittal cut will give a better view of the cingulate. Depending on the surgery, a combination of cuts will be used. The first plane is the sagittal plane. This divides the brain into left and right hemispheres. Take a look at the image. It is a cut down the middle part hairline. The second plane is the transverse or horizontal plane. This plane divides the brain into superior and inferior or upper and lower sections. In the graphic, you can see it is a cut horizontally through the forehead. The last one we will talk about is the coronal plane. 
This divides the plane into ventral and dorsal front and back sections. In the graphic, you can see that it is a headband cut. Next, we will cover the different types of neurosurgery. First is endoscopic surgery. This is a minimally invasive procedure. A very small incision is made into the skull to insert a thin tube called an endoscope. Interestingly, the endoscope may also be inserted through the nose. Attached to the tip of an endoscope is a very small camera, which allows doctors to view different structures or tumors. Vascular surgery is another less invasive procedure. Carotid artery angioplasty or stenting uses a small balloon or tiny metal scaffold to open up a narrowed artery. Narrowed arteries are due to cholesterol buildup and stenting is usually performed along the major carotid arteries in your neck or where you feel your pulse. Endovascular coiling is used to treat aneurysms or weakened areas of arteries that are prone to bursting if blood flow is not blocked. A thin metal coil is inserted into the blood block using a very thin tube and prevents blood from entering the aneurysm, which in turn prevents bursting. Take a look at the graphic of carotid artery angioplasty and endovascular coiling. Another type of surgery is a craniotomy. This is a very invasive surgery. As shown in the diagram, the first step is to cut open the skin on top of the head. And the second step is to remove a piece of the skull. After this, surgeons are able to treat the patient. Craniotomies can be used to treat many different conditions. For example, they can treat brain tumors, such as meningioma. They can also fix hemorrhages, which, as you may recall, occur when blood flows from a ruptured blood vessel. Additionally, a craniotomy can be used to treat aneurysms, which occur when an artery expands, weakens, and could rupture. Since the surgery is a very invasive and dangerous technique, it is only used when other less invasive methods are not able to reach the tumor or blockage. This next surgery is one of the newest techniques. The purpose of radiosurgery is to kill tumors with radioactive energy, and this can be accomplished through different approaches. One method it uses is called the gamma knife. This is when concentrated radiation is shot at a small area of the brain. This means the radiation will have a small effect on the entire brain, but a maximum effect on the tumor. The next technique is called proton beam therapy. This method is newer and is continuously becoming better and more accessible to hospitals. A proton is located in the nucleus of an atom as shown here, and it is the positively charged part. This technique works by bombarding the brain with protons, which are able to distort the DNA or close off vessels that are supplying blood to the tumor cells. The loss of blood supply will ultimately lead to the destruction of the tumor. Proton beam therapy only requires one session for treatment. However, after it occurs, the tumor takes between a few months to two years to shrink. Now we will be playing a short matching game. You will be shown a picture and a name of a surgical instrument or two. Then you will have about five seconds to determine which type of neurosurgery each instrument is used for. The first set of tools are the carotid stent and the endovascular coil. What type of surgery do you think they are involved with? That's correct. They are used during vascular surgery. This piece of equipment is called the gamma knife. What surgery do you think it is used for? It is used during radiosurgery. Next, we have the endoscope. What is this used for?
as you may have determined, this piece is involved with endoscopic surgery. Lastly, we have a scalpel. What type of surgery do you think it is used for? That's correct. It is used during a craniotomy. Now, we're going to talk about some more recent advancements in neurosurgery. Have you ever heard of an MRI? The development of magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is arguably one of the greatest breakthroughs in neurosurgery in modern day. MRIs use a magnetic field to interact with water molecules within your brain to create 3D images of it. This is extremely useful to neurosurgeons because now they can observe and analyze a patient's brain without any invasive surgery. By comparing the patient's MRI scans with healthy individuals, neurosurgeons can identify where tumors or other defects are present and be prepared before even starting surgery. Newer MRI machines are more spacious than older machines, giving room for surgeons to operate. Stereotaxy is locating things in a 3D plane using angles and other mathematical techniques. Old neurosurgery techniques always required a frame to be able to locate certain brain areas in the patient during a surgery. This was bad because one, it was hard to operate around such a clunky device, and two, it does not give real-time information so the surgeon would only be relying on information from scans taken before and after the surgery. And there is no immediate information on whether the surgeon is in the right place. Frameless stereotaxy uses MRI to solve this problem as it removes the cumbersome frame. By using a computer in the operating room that displays the MRI's images in real time, and marking certain parts of the skull using a sensor wand, the surgeon knows exactly where they are operating. You may already know that brains cannot be transplanted, and you would be correct. There have been no successful brain transplants in all of history. Although in 2017, there was a questionable operation that transplanted the brains of two dead bodies, but no successful operations have been done on two living humans. Why? While the brain's nerves are connected to the spinal cord and are currently impossible to reconnect, this is why spinal cord injuries are so dangerous. The brain is extremely complex and controls the functions that allow our bodies to work. With other organ transplants, we can temporarily substitute them with machines that will take over their functions, but such a machine does not exist for the brain yet because of the complex nature of its many functions. And so, as of now, the brain cannot be temporarily substituted with a machine. Today, we discussed the history and development of neurosurgery. Additionally, we were introduced to the many types of surgeries and what their uses are. Right now, this is a very exciting field to explore because there are many possibilities with new technology that are making these surgeries less dangerous and more accurate. Neurosurgery is very important because it includes essential jobs that can lead to saving many lives. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more information about UCLA Interaxon, please head to our website. And for more videos on neuroscience topics such as this one, please check out our YouTube channel. Thank you all so much for watching.